Uh, we started in 1979 with a few fields. I, t I came back from NDSU, attending NDSU, and uh, was challenged by a professor there. And uh, I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. So when I mentioned it to my dad, he said, well, we need to know more about this. So I started uh, interacting with some other producers and I got together with them, learned some more. And by 1980, we had the whole farm converted to no-till and have been ever since. Soil conservation was my first initial reason for doing no-till. But with the soil conservation came moisture management. When it started out, we were very dry in the 80s. So anything we could do to save moisture, leaving stubble on the surface so that uh, we wouldn't get as much evaporation. And uh, so not only were we cutting down erosion, but we were, we were building soil moisture so that we could annual crop because even this area was a third summer fallow when I was growing up. And uh, there was really no reason to ever have summer fallow here uh, once we learned the ability to conserve our moisture better. But then it went from there, from soil conservation, it went from, from just those aspects to now what we're learning so much more about the, what we're doing to the soil itself and the biology of the soil. So this whole soil health element came in and uh, that's been really exciting. So when we started uh, no-till in the, in the drier years and then in the 90s transition to be w above normal precip, significantly above normal, then all of a sudden moisture management took on a whole new meaning. It was not trying to save moisture but it was trying to get rid of moisture so that we could get our planting operations done. And that's when a lot of our no-till uh, enthusiasts that got really, really enthused about no-till in the drier years, uh, they tended to fade away from no-till uh, in the 90s because of too much excess moisture. And uh, so I had, to, I had to make a choice myself. Do I stay with no-till and figure out a way to manage the water, the excess water, or do I uh, quit the system altogether and go back to tillage? and I was just stubborn enough to, to try to figure out another way to do it. It's an agricultural system just like any other system. Uh, with conventional tillage you dry the soil out and some years you cause yield reduction because you've dried the soil out. You can get severe wind erosion through the winters if you reduce your residues. Well the no-till systems also have their uh, problems and in a lot of cases it's to do with excess water, uh, cool soils in the springtime at planting time, uh, slower emergence, uh, slower uh, crop growth in the springtime. But what we found is that if you're patient and you have the nerve for it, the crops usually by July and August are benefiting from those cooler soils or those more moist soils and they compensate for it later in the summer, sometimes even, even pay back dividends from uh, if it's a little bit drier summer, you can, you can actually have higher yields because even though it was slower going in the springtime, uh, it, it made up for it later in the summer. I've not really seen on my own operation that I've saved a ton of money no-tilling on direct costs because your costs shift. They shift from tillage to no-till equipment. They switch from, say, tillage to uh, some additional herbicide cost. They switch from fertilizer to cover crop seed costs. I don't see no-till systems being less expensive initially, but the payback, I believe, comes from, and I think I'm seeing that now, after, after enough years of no-till uh, and building soil organic matter, and that's, that's kind of the benchmark of where you're at with a healthy soil is, is if you're building organic matter. And uh, we've gotten our soils now built up to where we can actually start reducing commercial fertilizer use. And I think that's where all of a sudden then you start seeing uh, savings in, in the cost of no-tilling is reduced fertilizer use. Uh, one thing I, I learned, I learned from the Canadian and North, North Dakota farmers that I talked with in 1978 about no-tilling. The first thing they stressed was residue management. 
And it's still true today. It's just as true today as it was 40 years ago. You absolutely have to have the crop mass that you're bringing, gathering and bringing into the combine uh, or however you're harvesting it, you have to redistribute it evenly. Livestock producers have actually have an advantage in residue management because they can manage their residue with their livestock. But let's just say you don't have livestock in your system, then you need to make sure that residue is spread evenly uh, at harvest time. Because once it's laying on the ground and matted down, it's pretty difficult or impossible to move around short of doing major tillage to the field. You know, my, my primary advice would be to get your mindset that you're going to make it work. Because if your mindset is that the first sign of trouble I'm going back to tillage, then you may as well not even start because that's what you're going to do. If your mindset is, is I'm going to make it work, then you'll make it work. And all the tools are there for any producer to convert a tillage system to a less tillage or no tillage system. Uh, and all the tools are there for them to do it. They just have to get their mind wrapped around that they're going to make it work. You can do it. You can farm with a conservation ethic uh, and still make money and still protect the soil. And uh, uh, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to, to uh, keep our soil healthy and, uh, and make some money so we can pass down the farm to the next generation. Mm -hmm.